It styles itself as fresh, fearless, independent journalism. It values a free, fair and fearless media as the bedrock of a functioning democracy. It sides with migrants, striking workers and the left, and it calls itself the Canary. Founded by Kerryan Mendoza, a former management consultant turned writer who previously blogged at Scriptonite Daily, the Canary was launched as an alternative news site in October 2015 with four other writers. As Mendoza told journalism.co.uk, it was part of an effort to diversify our media, and within less than a year, it had become one of the most popular websites in the UK. Shafiq Mandai, writing for Al Jazeera, explains that by July of 2016, the Canary had broken into the top 100 news sites in the United Kingdom in terms of visits, and in doing so, it leapfrogged well-established online magazines such as The New Statesman and The Spectator. The newspaper of financial wide boys, City AM, was worried. The similar Web UK media index for July found the site rose 113 places to 97 in the month after the referendum, attracting 7.53 million page views. This puts the pro-Jeremy Corbyn site one place ahead of The Spectator on 7.47 million, and even more ahead of the New Statesman site on 5.36 million. And Marie Lacombe wrote for BuzzFeed about how, only nine months after it was launched, the website has over 20,000 Twitter followers, and more important, nearly 90,000 likes on Facebook. As of recording, it has over 27,000 followers on Twitter and just shy of 100,000 likes on Facebook. We have succeeded editorially and commercially, declared Mendoza, as Al Jazeera reported. The website credits its innovative business model for its success in a way that may be true, but it may also be one of the reasons why the Canary is, in some respects at least, bad news. What is unique about the Canary's business model is that what writers are paid depends on how many readers they have. As the editors put it, writers give up the certainty of payment, but if they're willing to take the risk, the rewards mean they're being paid in line with the profit they generate for the business. So they're not paid on a salary or piece rate basis, like most writers for newspapers, but on the basis of revenue. The Canary is often legitimately angry about the mainstream media. Editor kerry Ann Mendoza attacks the idea of post-truth politics by pointing out that corporate news media have been lying to people for years. Starting with a confrontation between Kathy Newman of Channel 4 News and the neo-fascist writer Milo Yiannopoulos, Mendoza supports Newman's claim that Yiannopoulos systematically purveys falsehoods, but goes on to point out Newman has her own post-truth skeletons. It wasn't so long ago that Newman claimed to have been thrown out of a mosque during Visit My Mosque Day. CCTV footage and eyewitnesses later revealed that she had merely turned up at the wrong venue and been politely given directions to the real one. Another angle of the Canary's attack on the corporate media is its sense of priorities. The Canary gives attention to issues or stories that it says are neglected in the press. Arms sales, the environment, war and the plight of refugees, among other things. But one result of the Canary's business model, as a former contributor told BuzzFeed, is that it produces clickbait, content designed to generate maximum eyeball attention for advertising revenue. If you incentivize writers to focus on this, you get fast turnaround hot takes and clickbait. It also reinforces filter bubbles. If writers are incentivized for hits, they'll write articles that they know will get shared by the publication's hardcore audience. Another former contributor explains, calling the Canary's model hyper-capitalistic, you can earn anything from £100 to £4,000 per month, depending on how viral you go. Of course, there's a certain irony in BuzzFeed calling another website's product clickbait. But for a left-wing website, the Canary's publishing model seems to be entirely market-led. This means always giving people false hope and false confidence. A fairly typical story, one which appears almost every week on the website, will contain a headline like, Jeremy Corbyn delivers a knockout blow to Theresa May, or the establishment media just went into full panic mode over Corbyn's victory at PMQs. The headline would say the same no matter what happened. They give the impression of offering an exaggerated caricature of what they think people on the left want to hear. The Canary also applies the same breathless, boosterish style to its own output. As it boasted in February 2016, 
editor-in-chief of the Canary, smashes myth of austerity to bits. One of the more controversial moments in the Canary's history was when it published a story about a junior doctor who had committed suicide, headlined, A junior doctor has killed herself, leaving a message to Jeremy Hunt in her suicide note. The news item, headed with juxtaposed images of the junior doctor and the health secretary Jeremy Hunt, went on to say, it is reported that the junior doctor specifically mentioned Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt in a suicide note left in her car, along with the pressure of working long hours and potential pay cuts. Dr. Polga had been actively engaged in the junior doctor struggle against Mr. Hunt's plans to increase working hours and reduce paying conditions for junior doctors. The implication of the story was clear. A heartless Tory government had, through its attack on junior doctors' pay and conditions, driven a young woman to her death. The suicide story was one of the most widely read stories in the Canary's young history, according to its findings with Google Analytics. But it was sensationalism. Hunt had been mentioned in passing in the discovered suicide note. There was no more to it than that. A dig around on her Facebook page told the Canary that Dr. Polger, like the vast majority of junior doctors, supported the struggle against Hunt's reforms. But it did not prove that the suicide was caused by that. The Canary was far from the only publication to sensationalise in this way, and it hardly invented these techniques. Even the supposedly quality broadsheets joined in. The Independent admitted that its own story headlined, Hunt in Doctor's Note, had attempted to create a political plotline out of an unsubstantiated detail. But to say that the Canary is as manipulative as the mainstream media isn't a good advertisement for what they're doing. The Canary also played a prominent role in supporting the Corbynistas during the attempt by right-wing Labour MPs to depose Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader in the summer. The Canary spotted that the Blairites are committing political suicide in launching this coup, and it invested a lot of its resources in trying to help the project come apart at the seams. Its most important intervention was a series of stories about Portland Communications. A PR group, it said, was involved in manufacturing the attempted putsch. The current Labour coup, being instigated against Jeremy Corbyn, appears to have been orchestrated by a PR company where Tony Blair's arch spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, is a senior advisor. The story noted that Portland has a number of Blairite apparatchiks employed at it, and that many of them are also involved with the old right-wing Labour society, the Fabians, whose leading members in Parliament seem to have been prominently involved in the coup. Voila! It surely can be no coincidence, the Canary asserted, that so many of the employees of this company are affiliated to both Labour and the Fabians. Of course, the assertion of no coincidence is an empty gesture. Either one has evidence of conspiracy or one hasn't. Nonetheless, the story had legs. Even Len McCluskey, head of the Unite Union, ended up repeating the claim on BBC television, accusing Portland of being involved in this orchestrated coup and it generated a toxic atmosphere in which no one knew what to believe. When one of Portland's partners received a death threat, seemingly on the basis of the story, it gave many Labour MPs an excuse to insinuate Corbynite responsibility. As Wes Streeting, a Labour MP, snidely tweeted, death threats, the new politics, as reported in The Guardian. The Canary uses tried and tested marketing techniques to reach a neglected market niche. Society's left wing, Corbyn supporters, trade unionists. As research by the London School of Economics showed, the old media is hugely biased against Corbyn and what he stands for. The appearance of a media outlet that articulates those values, combined with its critique of the corporate press, has proven to be a recipe for success. As BuzzFeed reported, one Canary editor claims that the website is not actually ostensibly left-wing, describing the editorial stance as simply broadly liberal. This suggests that any ideological commitment to the left is not unanimous on the Canary editorial team, and that the focus on the left is partly market-led. But the Canary uses the techniques of the right-wing clickbait media and the right-wing tabloids to target this audience. Moreover, in using the manipulative and dishonest techniques that it sometimes does, it participates in an insidious degeneration of information. 
like Breitbart and other right-wing equivalents, it is not so much a source of original news content as a repackager of content produced elsewhere. Like a blog or a filter service, it breaks a big, unwieldy mass of information down into easily shareable chunks of data, often making it seem far more interesting than it really is. That's the bad news. For all that is positive about what the canary stands for, the business model is irretrievably tied to a model that makes advertising revenue and hype the primary motive to write. It degrades the quality of the information we have and, despite Mendoza's critique, tends to confirm the complaints of the existing corporate media about the post-truth age. There is a crying need for a model of online journalism that supports real investigations and integrity in reporting. But the canary hasn't found it.